Thanks very much for the opportunity um, to come chat to you guys. Tough one to follow after Gordon. He was hilarious, eh? <laughs> um, so just a little quick uh, look at my background. is um, My journey to entrepreneurship, funny enough, began in a rowing boat with a dream to try and go and row at the Olympics. And uh, everything was going honky-dory and going reasonably well. And I was actually uh, in the under-23 crew with uh, some of the chaps that won gold, which was quite nice. And then I got a back injury. And I didn't really know what to do with my life. So I had read some self-help books, and they said, do what you love. So I thought, okay, obviously what I need to do now is build rowing boats, because I love rowing. So I ended up starting a little spares business, which led to a rowing boat factory where I was importing carbon Kevlar um, stuff, building high-end carbon Kevlar rowing boats, um, and did that for about two years, and realized that the dream of um, rowing or, or chasing Olympic glory was kind of very different to building rowing boats for rich kids, um, and decided that I wanted to do something else with my life. So there I decided that I wanted to get involved in entrepreneurship education. Um, and I've been in this sort of the space for about the, the last uh, six or seven years. Um, I did my master's, uh, my PhD, um, and I've been in, involved in a number of businesses since. Uh, at the moment I'm involved in a startup where we're doing a questionnaire which can predict, be used to predict whether an entrepreneur is going to succeed or fail. So trying to really automate what a, a high level VC does. Um, and then also I'm involved in, an, in a training organization which um, what we're doing is we're trying to develop a process where we can prove scientifically that if a person goes through this 10-week course, uh, we radically alter their chances of success. Um, where traditionally a lot of the research has shown that, in fact, um, entrepreneurship training, especially short-term training, actually doesn't impact um, entrepreneurial performance. So um, just I'm going to start my talk right at the beginning um, with Jean-Baptiste Say. And he's the person who actually coined the word entrepreneur. A French economist, which means to undertake. Now, George Bush is noted for saying that the problem with the French economy is they have no word for entrepreneur. <laughs> 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 uh, which is obviously totally wrong, considering it's a French word. But um, I think what he, the gist of what he is getting at is correct, that entrepreneurs create most of the wealth and jobs in an economy, especially uh, these type of entrepreneurs over here. Now, this is um, some statistics looking at your probability, if you are that registered business, of building a business that goes uh, over a million, over 10 million, and over 100 million. So, obviously, my big goal with the whole program and my work I'm doing is I'm trying to encourage 100 million type entrepreneurs, so people who build big, successful businesses. So, what I'm going to do is give you four big ideas. I mean, I've only got 20 minutes. Um, I usually, my courses are usually 40 hours, so I'm going to try to condense 20 minutes into 40 hours. Um, but I'm going to give you four of the biggest ideas I've come across that might help you guys set up your businesses. So the first one, a little country, is burn the business plan. <laughs> okay. um, there's been actually quite a bit of research done around business plans. And um, a study done at Babson College where Craig went, they did an eight-year study there and found that uh, students which wrote formal, I'm talking thick, 30, 40-page business plans, did not outperform those that did write them. And in fact, they did a study in Europe which found that if you are an inexperienced entrepreneur with limited management experience and industry experience, excessive planning actually increases your rate of failure, which is kind of scary. Also, if you look at the most successful entrepreneurs, so the study looked at 100 of the fastest growing businesses in America, found that 80% of them didn't write a formal business plan. Also, if you look at the stories of some of the most successful entrepreneurs, Branson, Zuckerberg, uh, the Intel founders, all of them didn't take the week or two and write this big formal business plan. So that's kind of dope, because that's really what we're doing in the entrepreneurship space, is you usually, to go learn entrepreneurship in a lot of the courses, you go and really learn how to write a business plan, which is a little bit silly, considering it's not really a predictor of success. So what we use in our courses is something called uh, Business Model Generation Canvas, where it's actually a canvas where it kind of fits with Gordon thing, where you can play with different business models. And you plan with sticky notes, and as the business changes, as you learn new things, it's almost like a discovery-driven planning, where um, it's, because it's such a chaotic process actually starting a business. The second thing is that um, plans are really theoretical guesses, okay? So what really is a business plan? It's a whack, not wives and girlfriends, <laughs> but just a wild-ass guess on what you think is going to work, okay? So um, really what you do then is you sketch out your guesses when you start the business. But often those guesses turn out to be wrong. So this is a guy called uh, Jörg Bergvist. He started, uh, founded the Ice Hotel in Sweden. I don't know if any of you are familiar with him. Um, so 
anyway, his story is kind of interesting. Is he ran a business where what he was doing is taking hikers and people in the summer, in the Swedish summer. It was like a tourist business. And then what happened in, he thought, you know, it was obviously a very seasonal business. I need a winter business. So he came up with the idea of having an ice exhibition to get tourists to come and make money in the winter. So he organized this big ice exhibition, um, gets, spends a whole ton, ton of cash on marketing. A bunch of people then pitch up to this exhibition. The day before the exhibition, there's a freak rain show. It, it rains. All the ice cups was melt. So he's now got this, spent a ton of cash on marketing, all these people coming, and no ice sculptures. So what he does is he just tells all the people who actually made the ice sculpture, we're going to do seminars. We're just going to teach people how to make ice sculptures. At least give them something to do. And what he found is that a lot of people started actually building igloos and then would go inside them and get all excited about, wow, let's really spend the night here. And that's where he said, no, no, I'm going to chuck the ice sculpture idea. Let's go with the, the hotel, the ice hotel. And that now does 44,000 visitors a year, massive revenues, and attracts tourists from all over the world. Um, however, this experience is very normal with high-growth businesses. In fact, they've done studies on some of the top entrepreneurs in the world and found that about 70% of them radically alter their idea on the way to success. YouTube, PayPal, um, a number of the famous entrepreneurial examples changed ideas. Um, so kind of like starting a great business is not like the traditional method where you, you, there you are and you've got this great idea and you just implement. It's more like you're walking down a corridor. And as you start the business, you're going to learn new stuff and realize there's actually a better opportunity down a corridor as you start walking. And you're going to learn and learn and learn, and probably your success is going to happen in a different market, selling a different product than the one you originally intended. So if we look at a practical example, there's Branson. Started out with the student magazine. Then he realized better opportunity with selling records through the magazine, which led to a better opportunity actually setting up record studios, which led to Virgin Studios is where he had his first major success. Similarly, I don't know if you, any of you recognize this guy, Evan Williams. Any of you heard of him? He's the only entrepreneur on the planet to start two companies which are on the top 10 most visited websites in the world. And those are Blogger and Twitter. And what's interesting about both those companies is both of them started as a different company. So when he started Blogger, it was actually, he started a company called Pyro Labs. And what ended up happening is that there was this note-taking feature in Pyro Labs that took off. And eventually he scrapped the project management and focused just on Blogger. Sold that to Google. Then went on and started Odeo, which you can see on the computer screen there, which was a company selling podcasting. It was kind of like iTunes. And then Apple launched iTunes, and he realized this is not going to work. Got his team together and said, guys, we need a new idea. The market's changed. And that's when they came up with the idea of Twitter. So um, what you really has got to happen is entrepreneurship is really a whole bunch of, uh, at least the early stages of entrepreneurship, is taking your guesses, testing them, and either if they work, keep going. If they don't, change them. And what we do is with our students is they'll run out all their guesses, and then they'll go do quick and effective tests to test whether those guesses make sense in the real world. Um, the big question then is how do you know when to stop searching? How do you know that you, you, your guess is right or wrong? And the big reason is you, you keep searching until you hit something called product market fit. I don't know if any of you are familiar with product market fit or the term. But it's really where you launch a product where the product you launch and the, the actual customers are lining up around the block to buy the product. There's, there's just a massive demand. You, you find that perfect product at the perfect time with the, the customers just really loving what you're doing. So what we get our uh, students to do is they actually go out and pitch before they've even done anything with their business and pitch their idea to, to anywhere from 20 to 50 entrepreneurs. And they can very quickly see whether they're going to get one of those four reactions. Either people are going to go, they're not interested, this sucks, or you're going to get level four reactions where people are going, this is amazing, I'm going to pre-order. And only when you're getting a lot of level three and four reactions, you know that this business idea actually has legs and it's willing to actually invest your time and energy in the business. So if you look at a lot of the great um, startups, they kept searching until they hit product market fit. So Facebook, 80% of Harvard signed up in the first couple of weeks. You look at Herman Mashaba, when he started Black Like Me, the black hair cap market was taking off at just the right time. And it, the sales just went nuts from day one. Um, the second thing you have to get right is customer satisfaction. Because if you sell a product and then no one buys again, what you really have is a fad. You're just going to get that happening with your product. 
So the big thing is you've got to get interest, but also repeat purchases. So again, if you looked at most of the successful companies out there, that's exactly what they get. They get this huge satisfaction rate of people coming back. So Facebook, you had this massive number of people coming back where people got addicted five times a day type thing. Similarly with um, Black Like Me, he was getting repeat purchases literally on a weekly basis. So he had really cracked the how to attract interest and how to keep people satisfied. And that's really where, where you want to go ultimately. <laughs> I just feel sorry for the person who tattooed Yahoo because obviously Google hadn't come out yet. <laughs> um, the fourth thing that really good entrepreneurs do is they don't grow until they actually hit product market fit. So if you do that, you're doing something called premature scaling. So you basically have your theoretical idea, and what you do is you try to grow the business straight away, okay, with no real facts that the, out, out of the building that the business is based on. So one of the famous examples is Webvan. Uh, this was a startup done in Silicon Valley where they had some of the top management talents in the world. And uh, what they did is they created this perfect business plan with all these assumptions untested. They raised billions in funding, and we're going to reinvent the grocery industry. What ended up happening? They ended up losing six billion rands worth of funding. Why is that? There were a number of guesses or assumptions in the business plan that were totally wrong. Customers cost more to acquire than they had planned. There were less repeat purchases. The delivery time of when they planned to deliver the groceries was wrong. Everyone wants their groceries delivered at night. They had all planned. They thought that people were going to order them during the day. So they had all these incorrect assumptions. And we're now finding that this is really one of the best predictors of failure. You find that 74% of high-growth startups fail because of this reason. They try to grow before getting to product market fit. Similarly, startups that actually do this correctly grow 20 times faster. So really, I can't give you the whole sort of game in a 20-minute session. However, what I can recommend to you guys is pick up a couple of books and really immerse yourself in this new understanding that we've developed in the last two, three years on how businesses start. So I'd recommend picking up the Startup Owner's Manual by Steve Blank, um, The Origin and Evolution of New Business by Omar, uh, Amar Binder, um, anything on effectuation and business model generation. And really uh, get comfortable with all of these concepts before actually going out and starting your business. Um, uh, just to finish off, uh, there's a, a, say, a, a joke which goes, do you know the difference between porches and hedgehogs? And obviously the difference is that porches have the pricks on the inside. Um, <laughs> which is um, obviously, so I think sometimes business gets a bad rap, especially entrepreneurship. However, if you look at a few cases, certain cases, really business can be a force for good. So this is a study done at MIT where they looked at the 25,000 living graduates. They found that of those 25,000 living graduates, um, their annual sales was $1.8 trillion, and they had created 3 million jobs. Similarly, the, and that would have added up to the 11th biggest economy in the world, just those 25,000 businesses, uh, high-growth businesses. Similarly, Joe Jacobson, um, what he did is he's the, a nanotechnology researcher who invented a way to actually do the e-ink paper display. And as a result, that's the basis that the Kindle was based on. And I did a calculation, and because of that, we will cut down 100, mil 100 million trees get saved every year because of that, uh, his, his commercializing that invention. Similarly, um, Greenpeace, one of the um, fish that is on the endangered species list um, is the bluefish tuna. And they thought that it really have a big chance of being extinct, and it was never thought that this could actually be bred in captivity until Hagen Stir, an Australian entrepreneur, worked out how to actually bleed these fish in captivity, and as a result, might save the bluefish tuna from the, from the ocean. So really, um, what entrepreneurship is about is, is solving problems in a profitable way. And I think that it can be used for an incredible force for good if you can find a scalable, profitable way to solve problems. So thanks very much for your time.